relationship on the rocks? Crushing on your best friend. Not sure how to tell your partner a secret? Luckily, you found Dear Romance Writer, an advice podcast from people who write happily ever afters for a living. We are Zio Axelrod, Avery Flynn, and Roan Parrish. You have questions. And we have questionable answers. Let's get to it. Okay, so today's first letter is from Widow49 Frankfurt. My husband committed suicide in 2018, Mm. and I'm 49 years old now. I feel too young to stay alone, but I've never been the best at flirting in my 20s when I was young and my body was fine. Now I'm well into my middle age with too many pounds and a need for progressive lenses, and I dread first dates and the awkward conversations involved. Am I doomed? Oh, I just want to hug this person i know oh my gosh um no it's no no you're not doomed (laughs) let's just start there we can yeah (laughs) let's just start there um actually i have a friend who was in a similar situation not too long ago she lost her husband and she they were married i think for 40 years something like that almost 40 years um she was in her late 50s and uh yeah, it was devastating. It was, it happened really quickly and, you know, it was just heartbreaking. And she went through a similar thing. Like, you know, is that it? You know, that was my love. That was the love of my life. That was my love story. Am I just now going to be alone? My kids are all, you know, she was empty nest. Her kids were married and gone with kids of their own. And she went, I forget where she went to some sort of like event that she didn't really want to go to. I think it was somebody's dinner party or something she went to. They dragged her out and she met this guy. (laughs) <laughs> and the guy was completely smitten with her and I remember the first time she told us about him she was like oh it was so awkward to have someone look at me that way who wasn't my husband and oh I don't know I just I don't think you know whatever and we were like no it was really cool you know you still got it you know because she's beautiful <laughs> and you know and then the next time she told us about him she's like well you know we decided to go out for coffee we're like yeah we're all trying to encourage her without you know yeah getting, you know, to, But I mean, now they're married, long story short, (laughs) they got married. Um, But, you know, and she was like, you know, lightning struck twice. You never know, you know, it's a, it's a heartbreaking situation. I can't even imagine um, losing someone like that, but you still have love to give. You still have life. You still have things to experience and enjoy. And if you can find someone um, to do that with, then I'd say go for it. You are not doomed. You're not destined to be alone. Like, don't think that way, please. Oh my gosh, I just want to hug this person so much right now. (laughs) I'm just absolutely hugging myself because I want to like reach out and hug them. Well, and you know, unless you are going to go date, I don't know, someone hot, somebody named somebody like super young and hot, like, I don't know, is Zach Efron still young? I think he's still super young. He's young to me. (laughs) right? I feel awkward looking at him and going, oh my God, biceps, you know? So I would say the people that you are going to be dating are more than likely in a similar boat than you are, right? Mm -hmm. And self-esteem can be just such a bitch, no matter what age you're at. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think probably looking back, if you were to think about it, it, you're like, your 20 some self when you were had your banging body you probably looked at it and said "Mm, I wish I could fix that and I wish Mm -hmm. I could fix that and it's just at this point in time that's in the past so you don't remember I would I would you know people who have kids and then forget how horrible labor slash you know infancy is when you can't sleep ever right you block that shit out Mm -hmm. (laughs) so You know, I would say, number one, when it comes to the physicality part of it, number one, be nice to yourself. Yes. Okay. Be nice to our friend. Um, So that's number one. Uh, You know, number two, know that you're not the only person going into this type of situation who has that. The people that you are meeting also probably will be feeling a little bit of insecurity. Um, And then three, I would say, oh my goodness find those things about yourself, especially when it comes to the physicality part of things, 
find those parts where you are like, I like that. Yeah. You know, find those things that you like and tell yourself again and again that you like them because you have to up talk. (laughs) I'm a fan of up talk, up talk yourself when you need to, so that you are being kind to your friend. Um, you know, that's not ego. That's, that's, you know, a personal pep talk, give yourself those personal pep talks. So in addition to everything that Zio said, because she hit it right on the head, you know, when it comes to those superficial parts that make you nervous, you know, relax a little. It's like the earlier episode we had where Rowan was talking about falling in love with yourself, dating yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that comes into play here too, because, you know, being alone so suddenly like that, you, you're rediscovering yourself, rediscovering what you like, what turns you on, like all that stuff. Um, don't be afraid to do that, you know. And isn't there a, a, a service for people over a certain age, like a dating site or something? I forget what it's called. Yeah, like our that. time or something like that. It's like something for people who are later in life looking for love at first or second or third time or whatever. But like, yeah. yeah I, and that's what I was going to suggest as well. I, I really agree with what you both said. And I think that one of the things that is so useful to remember is that um, even though you've had this terrible loss, you're coming into dating now with this superpower, which is that you know what you want in a relationship, you know what you need, you probably Mm -hmm. know the things that you don't want, the things that you uh, compromised on before but wouldn't now. And I think that that is such an extreme place of strength to be entering the dating pool from actually. Yeah, um, good point. And I would imagine that um, at this point in your life too, you have the advantage of having uh, not of not being willing to put up with the kind of bullshit that um, can skew the starts of relationships. Like, yep. <laughs> I would hope that at this point you're kind of like, I only have so much time to spend on other people and it would be great if some of that time could result in having a a partner in crime but I'm not going to put up with the Mm -hmm. I don't know like silly silly posturing that goes along with so much of dating which means that you're gonna naturally attract people who feel the same way Mm -hmm. so if you're being yourself on a date or chatting on a dating site or on a message board or something you're going to be putting out this like yeah, I don't have time for that because I just had however many years of a relationship where I didn't have to put up with that shit. And that vibe is going to attract other people who are like that. And maybe those will be other people who've suffered a loss in marriage so Mm -hmm. they can really know where you're coming from. I don't think it's like you have to date another widow or widower, but um, it would be, you would um, have the advantage then of being connected with someone who knows probably that your husband is still a real big part of your life, Mm -hmm. a big part of your memories, a big part of like the past you that you would bring to a relationship. And, and if someone knew that because they were probably experiencing the same thing, then that would, um, that would help you to make an instant connection or understanding about those things. But even if it wasn't a a widower, a widower, um, if it was just someone who could be a divorce starting over at this point in life, like, Mm -hmm. Like that's the best way to date is no bullshit, no posturing. Like, honestly, your people look gorgeous, no matter how many, like at whatever weight or body size or age, it really is just all about knowing yourself and knowing what you want and believing that you deserve it. Mm -hmm. Man, do that pep talk. Do that. (laughs) Yeah, that, that pep talk that she just gave you, do that one. And I do think that, um, as we've said in other episodes, one of the best ways of meeting other people who are like-minded, I think maybe isn't dating sites so much Mm as um, engaging really uh, enthusiastically in activities that you love and enjoy and trying to find other people who are enthusiastic about those things. So Mm -hmm. if you're an avid gardener, if you love yachting, I don't know what people do, croquet, painting classes and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. join a club, join an online chat room for that thing. Um, Find, or if you like, you love movies, find a group on Facebook or on Reddit or something where people like do watch parties. And even if you're not falling in love right away, if you can build up a network of people who you Mm -hmm. can spend your time with, 
then you you go some distance to um, replacing the social network that maybe mm-hmm. you lost when you lost your husband. And that is advantageous in its own right. Yeah. True. All right. So our second letter of this episode is from Second Fiddle to Nonfiction. I really am in a pickle and I think you are just the person to help me out. And by the way, I'm an editorial note. Um, our, our second fiddle uses a lot of exclamation points. And I just want to say, I love that. Thank you for the exclamation points. <laughs> All right. Starting again. I really am in a pickle and I think you're just the person to help me out. My partner of a little more than a year is a writer and is really good at it. She is so disciplined at her craft. She inspires me to take my own art more seriously. For these past few months, as a deadline looms, this has meant that in order to be present in her work, she starts writing early and has to go far away emotionally. She becomes cold and distant and seems to forget the usual sweet and light tone of our collaboration. At home, her chilly cloak takes a bit of time to thaw before we are able to reconvene emotionally. I want to be supportive but I am worried that if I don't say something about how this process fucks with my insecure attachment, the weight of my anxiety will overwhelm the foundation we have built. I also worry that saying more than what I have in passing to her about it, I will come across as unsupportive of her process. Got any tips? Thanks. Oh, that's a tough one. Second fiddle. Number one, up talk yourself with your name. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Right. But I, I I would just like to start off by saying what kind of stuck out to me um, in this letter a lot was the line where she says, the weight of my anxiety will overwhelm the foundation we have built. Mm. I would just simply say to Second Fiddle that, you know, number one, don't discount your own anxiety. Just because you're anxious about something does not mean that it doesn't have an impact or it's not real or it should be. Um, pushed aside. You can't shunt your own needs um, Mm. because of that. I think what may be helpful, especially if you guys are both writers, is to be able to um, take a moment, write down sort of what is emotionally occurring with you with the, your partner's process, right? So I accept that this is your process, but please know that this process hurts me because, and, you know, is there a a middle ground that we can come to for this, right? Um, Being able to do that in sort of a neutral way, as opposed to talking, especially if you're already anxious about it, um, that can help with approaching. And I would also say, try and, um, I mean, I know you'll probably feel this a lot during the process, the point in their process when they are emotionally withdrawn from you, um, if possible, if you have to hold on to that letter for a little bit, hold on to it and and provide that to them at a point in time when they are not in the middle of that point in their process, because mm-hmm. uh, more than likely your partner would be a lot more open to hearing this um, when they are outside of that emotionally withdrawn area. Mm-hmm. Creative process is 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 an individual thing, mm-hmm. and I think um, I studied. You know, I was a, an actress for a minute, and I knew a lot of method actors who would completely disappear into the roles that they took, no matter how dark <laughs> they were, um, and they would be different people. Like even at you know lunch or whatever, they'd just be completely different people, and you're like, whoa, that's like, and you're like, oh, that's so method, that's so you know, but. Um, I never thought about how it affected the people that they were with or the, their family or friends or whatever until I got older. And it's, you know, as a creator, you want to immerse yourself in your creation, but you have to be mindful of how it affects you in your real life. So I think it's a valid thing that you want to discuss this, how it affects you, how her creative process affects you. And I think like Avery said, that's a discussion to have when they're not in the middle of creating something, you know? Um, so that they're, if they're open and light, like you're used to them being when they're not creating, then definitely approach them in that place and say, hey, you know what? Let's open a bottle of wine tonight. And I wanna talk about our creative processes because you you said that you 
um, you take your own art, it takes your own art more seriously, which she does. I don't know if you're a writer or an artist or whatever it is, but you can still talk about the creative process. You can say, hey, this is what I do. And I noticed you kind of disappear into your work. Um, did you know that when you do that, this is how it affects me? You know, and if you approach it in a way that's not like accusatory or, you know, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like if you approach it in a conversational way and just say, hey, let maybe we could uh, just let me know and be aware of how you're how you're affecting me or maybe somebody else in their life as well. It couldn't just be you. Um, but I think like Avery said, just approach them when everything is feeling good so that you're starting from a good place and not from this place where you feel anxious and, you know, forgotten. Yeah, I think that's so useful also to compare it to method acting because to me, what, what method acting and writing have so much in common is that in trying to create these characters or write, if it's nonfiction, like yourself as a, uh, in, encounter yourself as a character is that it's about opening yourself up to, to really, really deep empathy, mm -hmm. trying to put yourself in the position of this other character or in the position that you occupied when you are experiencing what you're writing about. And when you're in that place of really open to empathy, of course, you're seeing the world in a different way. You're seeing the world through this like lens of that other being. And so that can, that really does change how you are, how you feel. And then if it's leaching into your life, then that's um, a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same thing is true though of how they could feel empathy toward you. And so if there's someone who's like, if she's someone who's used to opening herself up to that kind of empathy to do her work, then I do think that there's a good chance that she will be able to empathize with mm -hmm. your situation, what you experience um, as the like runoff of that artistic process. Mm -hmm. So I really agree that being very honest about how it makes you feel um, or how it affects you and, and addressing it at a time when she's not on deadline would be great. Um, I think that there's a really good chance that she would be open to that. Um, and it also sounds like she needs a transitional period. Mm -hmm. So like if what she's doing during the day is falling into the, the space of this other time, this other character, and then the, there's like a jarring kind of grinding of what her getting back to your relationship. It sounds like maybe she needs um, a half an hour of meditating, exercising, showering, whatever her jam is for like decompressing or staring at a video game or watching an episode of TV, whatever it is, um, to kind of like transition out of the mode of being that character and into the mode of being the self that interacts with you. Mm -hmm. And maybe a great way to start the conversation again at a moment not of deadline is being like, it seems like you have that it's like a bit jarring for you to enter back into our life at the end of your writing day. Is there like a process that we could set up for you that I could be supportive mm -hmm. of where at the end of writing, it's not like you write until 6.30 and then we have dinner at 6.35, but mm -hmm. you write until six and then from six to 6.30 or six to seven, we've set up this sort of um, like decompression tank mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, then, and you do whatever you need to do in that hour and then at seven, when we have dinner together, we're together, like mm -hmm. we are here. And that might mean asking her about what she's been writing. It might mean talking about your own writing. It could be like talking about your vacation or whatever you talk about at dinner. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I think if you're the person who's doing the writing, you feel a lot of pressure to maximize the, any time that you're not writing to be with the people in your life. Mm -hmm. So you think like, if I'm done writing at 6.15, then at 6.15, I should start interacting because I've already been away for this amount of time. Yeah, yeah. And so just giving her permission to take until seven and like extend that so that she has 45 minutes or however long to come back to you in a way that feels healthy for her and still respectful of her process, that permission, I think, and, and saying that it's worth spending a little less time together to make the time you do spend of quality would be potentially really helpful for de-stressing her at the end of writing, as well as um, helping you experience her the way you're used to. Mm -hmm. And I think this is such a universal thing too. I mean, I, Second Fiddle really talks about this in 
reference to writing, but I think you can also turn this back with, with the pandemic right now and so many folks being home and working from home, Mm -hmm. if they're able to, there isn't that commute home. And you know, where people between... get to depress, mm-hmm. where, where they don't yeah. have to talk, you know, where they yeah. can just do that thing. And so I think this is probably an issue that a lot of people are dealing with right now, especially if you're stuck in the same um, residence together, mm-hmm. you know, the whole time that can be finding those decompression points and ways to do it are really important. And um you totally reminded me of one of my best friends from college. She, uh, five girls, right? All very loud. (laughs) And that's me (laughs) saying that. All right. I love them. (laughs) Um, all very loud, right? And five girls, one house, the mom, the dad, the dad would go to work. He would come home and go downstairs to the basement. He would get a Schlitz, literally a Schlitz from the basement beer fridge because it's the midwest so we have beer fridges so you go get the schlitz from the beer fridge he would have one beer no one would go downstairs no one would bother him and then he would go upstairs when that beer was done and it was daddy's home you know so decompression is necessary whether it's because you're in a creative process whether it's Mm -hmm. because you're in a pandemic whether it's just, you know what, my job is that stressful or I just need it, you know, take the, it's self-care, <laughs> take mm-hmm. that time. Yeah. yeah. And the last thing I, I would add to that is I liked that we were talking about the part where you said that her um, talent and drive really helped your artistic process. As mm-hmm. well. And I think that it's like, let's not, let's not decouple those things because mm-hmm. I think that sometimes it, it is in fact the, the sort of like, ooh, is she a little too intense about her process or does that make my life harder? Like the flip side of that is the person who's so passionate that, that she really inspires you to up your ante in your own work. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, that's a con. It's not feeling great right now, but also there is the pro side to that con. And I think that like, it's great for you to talk to her and see if you can um, massage this process and all these things. But I also think it's important that we never forget that some of the qualities in our partners that we find challenging, that the flip side of those are some of the things that we love the best about them and that we Mm -hmm. can't really just like Mm -hmm. fiddle with them like an Instagram filter, you know, like slightly and, and down the shadows. Like sometimes if you want high contrast, you got to have dark shadows Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, just like keeping in mind the the benefits that you reap that might be a, a direct result of that kind of intensity. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this week's playlist, guys, is called Getting Back to Love, of course. Um, and it's all over the place, I have to say, but I did put a Taylor Swift on there, put Taylor Swift song on there for you, Avery, because I always tease you about your Taylor Swift love um but delicate is the song i don't know if you know that song oh, that is a good one yeah it's a good one um i've got rihanna's russian roulette on there um i've got some sam smith florence and the machine childish gambino death cab for cutie the chain smokers usher Roxette. like it's all over the place but they're all songs about either finding your way back to someone or finding your way back to a place where you want to be with someone so i think i think it's a good one you guys will have to let me know what you think I love that. Um, Well, so this week's recipe is based on the first line of our second letter, which was, I'm in a real pickle. Uh, I couldn't resist because I love pickled things. And I considered several different recipes um, and I finally landed on this pickled cucumber salad that I really love. Mm. It is um, crisp and bright because it's raw, the, the cucumber is raw. Um, mm-hmm. So it's perfect for summer, but I also do it with like a sesame oil. So you can really do it in the winter too. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like a vinegary, sesame e garlicky, pickled cucumber salad with fresh herbs. Nice. Uh, really delicious. That sounds delightful. Um, just make sure you have like a lot of mouthwash if you're going to make out afterward because the garlic <laughs> is intense, but it's super worth it. I promise you, rest. Or you just both eat it. I was gonna say you both eat it. Yeah. You're getting back to love, eat it together, and yes, yeah. listen to the playlist. 
get back to the love of garlic <laughs> like our ancestors and uh eat some garlicky pickle yummy that sounds yummy. delicious <laughs> well our recs for this week um so we had a in a past episode, a little chat about, you know, things that you can do together to sort of keep the spark alive. Mm -hmm. Well, the fab Mr. Flynn and I have been married for 20 some years. Wow. I know. And um, we kept falling into the dreaded Netflix, Hulu, um, Disney Plus, Apple TV, you know, all the streaming systems where you just go through mm -hmm. forever and not find something to watch. So we have instituted movie nights at our house. And what we did was we each got, because we have completely different tastes in movies. So we, that's the other part that makes it last forever. We are a true opposites romance, um, opposites track. So we each picked out 10 movies that we'd never seen. We shared the list with each other just to make sure there were no like firm, hard, you know, no, I'm not watching that ever. You can't make me. Mm -hmm. And then we put them in a little container and we get to pick and we do one each time. And so we picked out his last one that we picked that uh, that was drawn that he had made was Black Lace and Blood. And it is a horror movie, an Italian horror movie from like 1964. I was gonna say as well. Oh, it's yellow. It's dubbed. We made it 15 minutes in. Um, <laughs> I like, <laughs> I, I love horror movies. I do not like slasher movies. So mm -hmm. it was a little bit of that. But so we ended up just picking the next thing that happened to pop up. And for some reason, the algorithm recommended the Phantom Thread. Which is oh, really <laughs> well, that's random. You can get, um, but there, you know, there maybe you can see some parallels with, you know, poison mushrooms. Um, watched it we had never seen it it was really really good highly recommend it if you like dubbed italian slasher horror movies finish up black lace and blood and tell me what you think it's free on prime um but we did not make it but i do definitely recommend phantom thread avery i did not know that you were a horror movie fan and i'm really delighted to hear that <laughs> oh i I like scary horror movies and like mind fucks. I yeah. do not like yeah, me like, too. like Freddy and Jason and all that stuff. I'll never watch the screen movies or not yeah. screen. The what are the ones with the, like Saw. hostel and things like oh, yeah. that? Saw. Oh, oh. So the first Saw was me. like a psychological thing. Oh, but then it? after that, they just went for like, how many body Gore parts fest? can we cut off? <laughs> yeah, the yeah. first one is pretty trippy. All but, right. Yeah. I, I might give that a try then. So. Our, horror, our horror episode is going to be awesome. We're going to have to pick oh some God, horror. Right? For our Halloween horror episode that we've just decided that we're doing. Uh, yes. on the podcast. <laughs> and also <laughs> we should do a, um, okay, sorry, this is like a little just a uh, uh, sidebar, but um, yesterday for Valentine's Day, um, what Timmy and I decided to do was to watch romantic horror movies and play Horror Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> Um, so we watched we well one that we watched that was great was bell book and candle from 1958 mm. oh. it's not really a horror movie it's like a, no like, but it's weird it's weird yeah weird and witchy I um that one. but i but when we were going through lists of like horror movies that deal with romance there's so many we should do an episode that is like answering questions about relationships from horror movie characters like <laughs> hey, my ex-husband or my husband seems to be obsessed with his ex and the and the maid seems really obsessed with her too, but she died mysteriously. What's going on? <laughs> I would That's love that so much. Yeah. yeah, I like that. This must happen. Yes. It has to happen now. Anyway, um, my rec <laughs> is also a horror movie, kind of. It's not really very horrific. Um, it's called Bite, B-I-T-E. It's from 2019 and it is a vampire movie um, I had never heard of it. I, we were just scrolling through uh, maybe Shutter the other day and found it. Um, but it's it's delightful. It's about like teen and young adult age characters. Um, and the main character is a trans girl who goes to LA to stay with her brother for a little while. And on her first night in town, she goes to a club and like falls in with this gaggle of vampires. Uh, what is want to do? Like you do. In LA, I mean, what else do you do? <laughs> exactly. 
LA in a club, always have those. Oh, and it's uh, yeah, it, it was pretty delightful. It has a terrible rating on IMDb and people <laughs> making fun of it for being awful, but it's like legit delightful. Okay, I'm gonna have to watch that. This. Only from Roan would you get, oh, this great horror movie. It's delightful. <laughs> you are so Wednesday Adams. It's just not even funny. I love it. It's my favorite. Well, I went for, um, I, I have like comfort watches, you know, those movies that you just uh-huh. returned. Like Fifth Element is one of my comfort watches. I watch it like a billion times. But one of my new ones that I just discovered is a comfort watch for me this weekend is Old Guard on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it yet. I, did see it. I have not. Yeah, it's based on a graphic novel, I think. Um, and it's Shirley's Theron as yeah. this immortal. Mm-hmm. Um, she's like the oldest of these immortals. And they never really say how old she is, but we were talking like thousands of years old. It's just, it's like the perfect action. There's like lots of, of heart. There's a lot of found family stuff. There's a wonderful gay romance in it. Oh my God, those guys, like every time they come on the screen and they talk to you, there's just, there's this monologue. I won't give it away, but there's a monologue that one of them has about his partner. And it's just the most beautiful love letter, like oral love letter you will ever hear. It's amazing. It's such an amazing movie. So yeah, and it's on Netflix. And I think I've seen it half a dozen times now. So it's officially one of my comfort watches. All right, that keeps coming up in my rack, so I'm going to put it on now. Watch it. Yeah. Okay. I could watch Shirley Theron in anything, but really, but it's a good movie. I just yeah. rewatched um, Fury Road, speaking of Shirley <gasps> Theron. I love that. I love, and she's just it's so damn watchable. Yeah. You know, that was one of those movies I actually got to see in the theater back when we could Ew. do that. Ew. Oh, my God. It was, that was such a trip. I love that movie. That's one of my comfort watches. It's her other film. I can't think of the title right now. The one where it's like she's a spy in the 1980s. Um, oh, is that I've the Atomic like, Blonde? Atomic Blonde. That's okay. another one of my comfort watches, which I haven't watched in a while, so I might watch it tonight. But yeah, I love that film. Welcome anyway. to our podcast, the Charlize Theron. <laughs> this is now a Charlize Theron Stan podcast. So. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. All letters Sorry, y'all. must now deal with. <laughs> Dear Sorry. <Charlize. laughs> Thank you so much for listening. What did you think? Did we get it right? Totally got it wrong? Let us know. And remember to follow us on social media, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and YouTube, and tell your friends to do the same. Plus, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter at DearRomanceWriter.com for all the latest and to get access to special Patreon-only content. As always, keep sending in those letters at DearRomanceWriter.com. You have questions, we have questionable answers. See you next time.